You've got to be careful you don't say things like, I'm obsessed with Ted. That can go down the wrong way. About two years ago, I had an opportunity to pitch for a piece of work with a company in Manchester. And they invited me to their offices in the city centre. And of course, on these occasions, you don't want to be late, so I arrived nice and early. But I got there so early that I had time to kill. So I popped into Cafe Nero next door just to grab a coffee and get my head in the right place. And then I walked across to their offices and they led me through to a beautiful glitzy boardroom, all glass and chrome and a big wooden table. And there were two directors at the table, the people I was going to be pitching to. And then a lady walked in and she said, uh, would you like a coffee? And I said, well, I've just had one, thank you, I'm fine. And then she said, well, I'm popping next door to get a posh one from Nero and I'm from Yorkshire and you can't turn anything down that's free. So I said, well, fine, I'll, I'll have a decaf, thank you. So off she went and she came back 10 minutes later armed with three takeaway coffee cups, two for the directors, two regular ones, and mine's got the little stamp on top to show that it's a decaf and that's for me. So the meeting starts. Now, you know a meeting's going well when they make strong eye contact with you, and goodness me, they were looking intently at me. So I'm thinking, well, I'm getting through here, this is going well. And then at the end of the meeting, they say, well, could you propose how we can work together? And of course, that's a great buying signal, so I'm feeling pretty good about myself when I drive home. And then my mood darkened when I looked in the rear view mirror, because I'd obviously had a nosebleed big red mark on the end of my nose and I thought oh no but I looked again and it wasn't quite the right color it was a bit pink and then it dawned on me that during the meeting the ink on the top of my coffee lid had transferred to the end of my nose <laughs> and they never said a damn word for an hour during which I must have looked like a clown and I thought, well, that explains the eye contact. That's why they were staring at me in that way. So I'll return to the red nose pitch a bit later on. But I mention this story because I think it's an example of one of those little mini magical moments that happens to us from time to time. You know, daft stuff, unexpected things. And from a conversational point of view, they're absolute gold. They really are. But many people let them sweep by, they don't recognize them, they don't use them, and I think that's a missed opportunity. But you may say, well, why does this really matter? Why does this matter to me? Well, I think it does matter because there are certain times in our lives when we really do have to give a good account of ourselves, to stand out, to make a good impression, and I'll mention three. Firstly, when we are representing a company we're doing the whole networking thing, we have a product or a service to sell. Secondly, if we're in the employment market, we're looking for a job. And thirdly, if we're looking for love, if we're doing the whole online dating thing. And I can see you all nodding there. <laughs> and do you know what? People in these situations don't find it easy. They find it quite challenging. And I think that's perhaps for a number of reasons. You get people, for example, who start with the premise that they're just not an interesting person at all. They deliberately downgrade people's expectations. They're, you know, nothing interesting ever happens to me. I'm an accountant, it's a boring job, whatever. And they're happy to reside in this obscurity, this twilight, because it feels safe. But of course, it doesn't serve their interest because they're actually having to stand out for a change. Then you have people who are really like a closed book they're very hard to get to know because they're reticent to share what's beneath the surface. They're happy to talk about stuff that's on the surface, maybe what they do for a living, you know, where they travel from. But anything deeper than that is difficult territory for them. We, we struggle to connect with them, we may not find them trustworthy, and we may take our attention elsewhere. Then there are those people who are too open. They'll reveal all the graphic details of their latest procedure at the doctor's and you go whoa thank you that's a bit too much too revealing and then there are those people who try too hard and we see this a lot in the business networking arena where they're after a quick win you know they'll thrust their business card in your face they come across a bit aggressively and um, and then midway through the conversation they turn into the meerkat they stretch their neck up and scan the room for someone else to speak to because clearly you're not in the market for them at that moment. 
very rude. But happily, there is room for optimism. In my many years in business and meeting people from all walks of life, I've met some very skillful practitioners at the art of selling themselves. They just come across well. They're very good at um, engaging you in conversation and building rapport and trust quickly. So let's pause for a minute and think, what do these people do so well? Why are they so good at this? Well, I could list a whole raft of characteristics but we haven't got time to go through them all. So I'm gonna focus for now on three. These are three characteristics that I find in people who come across as interesting, engaging, and charismatic people. And maybe we can all learn from these. Number one, they're always hoovering. Not hovering, hoovering. And what I mean is they're always sweeping up these little mini stories that they hear, either of their own experiences or those from others, and they put them into a kind of a mental filing cabinet. It's like a story library. And they're able to pull the right one out at the right moment and seamlessly weave it into a conversation. And it's an impressive social skill. But you know they do more than that because they're able to then use those stories to make a broader point. And I'm going to do something quite unusual now. It's a bit unconventional to do this, but I'm going to draw and analyze from a very a tiny moment in another TED Talk. We haven't seen it today, but you must watch it if you haven't seen it. It's Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson, spoke in 2006 about why schools kill creativity. And it's the most viewed talk of all the TED library. And the story in question involves um, a teacher in an art class with all these little boys and girls drawing away. And there are four lines of dialogue in this little micro story. And they go as follows. Teacher says to the girl, what are you drawing, Emily? The girl said, well, I'm drawing a picture of God, miss. The teacher said, well, that's interesting because we don't really know what God looks like, do we? And the little girl said, well, you will in a minute. <laughs> and I feel bad because that's Ken's story, but I'm telling it for a reason because what he does is that he uses a technique I call zooming in and zooming out. So he zooms in tight on this little incident and then he pulls out and he makes a broader, much more profound point that in his view, Kids will take a chance, they're not afraid to get things wrong. As we grow older, uh, we build up this fear of making mistakes, it constricts our creative capacity, and in his view, the education system is largely to blame because of its focus on exam results, on getting passes, and the way it stigmatizes mistakes. So, characteristic number one, Hoover, always be hoovering. Your partner may agree with hoovering, by the way, but I don't mean that kind of hoovering. And make sure you start to use these stories to good effect and make them relevant. Characteristic, characteristic number two is be interested. There's a curious paradox about interesting people because they actually spend a lot of time being interested in things in the world around them, in people. And we find it quite flattering, don't we, when people take an interest in us, when it's genuine, when they ask really good questions and they, they listen intently to the answers and they're able to develop the conversation and build in these conversational threads. Again, an impressive social skill. And it also takes the pressure off having to say interesting things all the time because you're letting the other person do the work. But do you know you can also create curiosity and interest in others? You can make them curious. About five and a half years ago, it was in the summer of 2011, I walked into the Hilton Hotel in Manchester, the big tall building on Deansgate, and I walked into the bar, and there was a lady at the bar with her back to me, but I knew this lady really well, and I walked over to say hi, and when she turned around, my goodness me, I got the shock of my life. It wasn't her. Complete stranger. But you know, the first three words that she said to me stopped me in my tracks 
and changed my life forever. That's all made up, by the way. That never happened. But I bet you want to know what the three words were, won't you? <laughs> it's a bit cruel that I know, and it, and it wasn't, are you single? That would have been nice, maybe. But I mention this again because sometimes you can come across as interesting when you leave something out, leave people with a cliffhanger ending, and because they want to know more from you, I guess by definition you're interesting. The third characteristic of interesting people I would describe as a willingness to lift up the bonnet. And I'm talking here about openness, not the undesirable openness we heard about before where things are revealed that ought to be kept private. I'm talking about a willingness to let people know what makes you tick, what's going on beneath the surface. And again, we said that people sometimes are reticent to go there. But it's, it's very, very interesting to know not just what people are doing, but why they're doing it and why they've turned out the way that they are. And I'll tell you who finds this very important and very interesting, and that's interviewers. Because interviewers want to see what's beyond what's on the CV, beyond the qualifications and the past work experience. If any of you watch The Apprentice, I think it's on at the moment when this is being recorded, but um, about maybe three or four years ago, there was an episode of The Apprentice, and it gets down to the final three candidates. And this is where Alan Sugar wheels out his scary interviewers. And they're horrible to the poor candidates. I mean, some of them deserve it, but I mean, the last three that we get down to. And there was a young woman called Bianca who was being grilled by this female entrepreneur, one of Alan Sugar's trusted advisors. And she said to Bianca, she said, now, Bianca, you strike me as a very strong and determined young woman. You're obviously hell-bent on this path to success. But I find you very frustrating because I have no idea who you are. You're hiding behind this mask of strength and invincibility, but I have no idea what's going on underneath. And that's what she was really after. If Bianca had revealed... Um, maybe uh, an individual who'd inspired her earlier in life or an incident that had happened to her a few years ago that shaped her in some way and helped her turn her into the person that she became. That would have been very interesting because we get to know the person, which of course is what the interview is after. But you know, the problem there is that this whole vulnerability thing then comes in, you know, will people find it interesting? Am I going to expose a weakness? So that's an issue to get over. But also, you actually have to reflect a little bit on who you are and what you've been through to come up with something to say in the first place about all this squidgy stuff going on underneath. So there we have it, three characteristics of interesting and engaging, sometimes charismatic people. But I promised, didn't I, earlier on, that I'll return to the red-nosed pitch and explain how things panned out. Now, the funny thing is that they hired me despite the Rudolph thing. And I rang them the next day and I said, look, did I look a bit strange in that meeting? And they said, well, yes, you did, but we, we didn't want to embarrass you in case you had a spot on the end of your nose. It wouldn't have been the right thing to say. So, but I'm convinced in hindsight that that incident helped to seal the deal because somehow it changed the relationship between us from being one of buyer and seller where the buyers got their defenses up because they know they're being pitched to, to one that was much more human because I think of the vulnerability of the way I looked at the time. So if I were to pull all this together now, I would say that if you want to be interesting, you've got to connect with people. And the best way to do that is to tap into the thing that we all have in common and that's our basic humanness. So you can talk about your successes, achievements, career highlights, but people won't necessarily find that interesting or endearing because you're trying to impress rather than connect. And you might be better served by sharing a couple of significant experiences that you've had, how you've reflected on them since, and the lessons that you've learned along the way. Terence Gargiulio, the author, once said that the shortest distance between two people is a story. 
So to find a bond with another person, draw from that well of experiences that you have inside of you. And I'm not just talking about the big chunky experiences either. It's often the smaller, closely observed moments that provide better material. And don't just talk about them in a factual sense. Talk about the emotions associated with them, the, the joy and the sadness, the surprise, the excitement, the embarrassment. These are things everybody can relate to because they're distinctly human things. But of course, you've got to embrace this thing about lifting up the lid and showing people what's in your heart and not just what's in your head. So if you want to come across in these situations as interesting, engaging, maybe even charismatic, remember those three tips. Always be hoovering, be interested, be willing to lift up the bonnet, and perhaps most importantly of all, choose decaf. <laughs> Thank you.